Uh, let's uh, look at Luke chapter 22, verse 1. Now, the title for the sermon uh, this morning is The Last Supper. So as we're reading through that chapter, I'm sure you guys gathered that we were looking at the Last Supper here. So the title is The Last Supper. Let's pick it up from verse number 1. It says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. Now, keep your finger there. We're going to go straight to the book of John. Go to John chapter 2, please. Okay? So we know this is the final week before Christ is crucified. In fact, he's going to be crucified within 24 hours at this point. Okay? And uh, so let's go to John chapter 2, please. Because I just want to show you why we know that Christ's ministry lasted for three years. Okay? And I'm sure I've mentioned it before. But the reason we, we know it's lasted three, three years was because during the ministry of Christ, there are three Passovers that are mentioned. So let's look at the first Passover here in John chapter 2, verse 13, please. John chapter 2, verse 13, because the book of John is the only one that actually captures all three Passovers, okay? But John chapter 2, verse 13, it says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So as the practice was to go up into Jerusalem there, verse 14, And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sitting. So you guys may recall, this is the first time that Jesus goes in and cleanses the temple. Okay, He casts out the, the uh, money changes there. And then just drop down to verse number 20. Because I want to show you some uh, consistency as well with the Passover during the ministry of Christ. Verse number 20. Then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So notice with his first, the first Passover in his ministry, he is teaching about his death and burial and resurrection. You know, he's already pointing people to the fact that he's going to die, that he's talking about his own uh, temple of his own body that would be risen from the dead. Now let's go to John chapter 6, please. John chapter 6. We're going to have a look at the second Passover in his ministry. So that should, you know, work it out for you that between John chapter 2 and John chapter 6 is a period of one year, okay, that takes place there. John chapter 6, verse 4, it says, And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. Verse 5, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these, uh, that these may eat? So I won't go into the story now, but this is the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Okay? Uh, Jesus feeding of the 5,000. He's speaking about getting bread there. And then we're going to have a spiritual application to that bread. Drop down to verse 25, please. John chapter 6, verse 25. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, so the same multitudes find Jesus on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, it's the same guys. Uh, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Oh, here you are. <laughs> we found you. When did you get here? He said, verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Very verily I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Okay, so the same group of people that were fed by the loaves of bread. Verse 27, Labor not for the meat which perish, perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So here's Jesus teaching a spiritual concept, okay? Seek for the food, that the meat that will give you everlasting life. Now let's drop down to verse 53. Verse 53 there, what is Jesus speaking about? Verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. So what's this spiritual bread that Jesus is referring to? His, his flesh, his blood. Verse 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. So of course, this was a hard saying for the people at this time. And the Roman Catholics really mess this up because they think when they, they partake, partake of, the, of their communion, of their mass, they think that that wafer, that they, when, when it goes into their mouth or when it's blessed by the priest, they believe it becomes the literal, the literal flesh of Christ. They believe they're actually eating 
flesh of a human being when they partake of that, that wafer, okay? And when that, when that, uh, when that uh, wine is blessed by the priest and they drink of that wine, they believe they are literally drinking the blood of Christ. Literally the blood. They think that's blood that they're drinking. And so they take that teaching here from John chapter 6, and it kind of sounds that way, but if you just drop down to verse 63, John chapter 6, verse 63, it says, Jesus says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. Okay? It's, what he's teaching is a spiritual truth. And then he goes, the flesh profiteth nothing. Like eating my flesh will profit you nothing. He's not talking about literally eating his flesh, literally eating his blood. No, it profits nothing. It says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Hey, I was speaking to you a spiritual truth, okay? You spiritually have to partake of my flesh and my blood in order for you to have eternal life. Once again, Jesus Christ here is cryptically teaching about his death, burial, and resurrection. Look at verse 64 there, John 6, 64. How do we receive the flesh? How do we receive the blood? But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning whom they were that believed not and who should betray him. You see, the people that would not participate of his flesh and blood would be those that would believe not. So how do we spiritually partake of his flesh and blood? We believe on him. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we have eternal life. And of course, in verse 64 there, Jesus is alluding to Judas Iscariot, who would not believe, who would betray him. Okay. So that was the second Passover that we read about in the ministry of Christ. We won't go into the third Passover in the book of John because we're reading about it here in the book of Luke. So if you guys can go back to Luke chapter 22, please. Go back to Luke chapter 22. So if you're wondering, how do we know it's three years of Jesus Christ's ministry? That's why. Three Passovers during his ministry. Go to verse number two now. Verse number two. It says, And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. So if you guys remember from last week, uh, Jesus Christ was going into the temple, wasn't he? You know, he'd go into the temple every day to teach. You know, he'd be critical of the scribes and the Pharisees and the, and the priests. And so they wanted to kill him. But they feared the people. You know, they knew if we took him, if we arrested him, the people love him. The people are flocking to hear his preaching. If we take him, they're going to be against us, you know. The believing Jews love Jesus. Verse number three. Then, then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. So here we have um, the first time that we read about Satan himself, okay? Um, you know, the, the prince of the power of the air, you know? This is the first time we read about Satan actually possessing a human being. Now, of course, in the Bible, we read about other men that are possessed of, of devils, but this is the only time, and actually this is, the, this is one of the, uh, the two times that we see Satan actually possessing a person. But by this time, if, Ju if Judas was not a, a reprobate by this time, he definitely was now. Okay, he definitely was now. Jesus Christ is, is on his way to being crucified and Satan enters into Judas. And uh, possessors of the devil, he became a vessel for Satan. I mean, you know, Satan was looking for a way to kill Christ. You know, seeking for a way to betray Christ and he found it in the vessel of Judas Iscariot. And so, of course, the other... The second person that gets possessed by the devil, we read about that in the book of Revelation, and that is the beast. That is the Antichrist, okay? And it's really interesting that both of these men, Judas Iscariot and the Antichrist, are given the title of son of perdition, okay? That means son of damnation, or a, or a child of the devil, if you want to put it that way, okay? They're both given this same title because they're the only two men in the Bible that actually get possessed by the devil himself, possessed by Satan himself. Verse number four. And he went his way, that is, that is Judas Iscariot, and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. All right, so here we have a guy that's been in the ministry of Christ. He's seen the miracles. He's been a friend to Jesus Christ. You know, I'm sure he, I'm sure he was blessed, you know, by the ministry of Christ. I'm sure he, 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 he learned many things, and yet he never believed on Christ. You know, what a waste of a life. And... Um, this is, you know, many people believe, I'll just read it to you quickly from Psalm 41 verse 9. Many people believe this is a fulfillment of this passage, Psalm 41 verse 9, which says, Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat at my bread, have lifted up his heel against me. 
Many people believe that Psalm 40, not 41 verse 9 is a reference to Judas Iscariot as a, as a friend to Jesus Christ, as someone that was fed by Christ, that was a friend to Christ, as it were, lifted up his heel against Christ there. And I, I, I believe that reference is about Judas Iscariot as well. Look at verse number 5. And they were glad, all these that were conspiring against Christ, they were glad and, and uh, covenanted, coven, covenanted to give him money. Now, keep your finger there. Go to Matthew 26 now. Matthew 26. So, Judas gets paid. Gets paid to plan um, a way to betray Jesus Christ into the hands of the scribes. Go to Matthew 26, please, verse 14. Matthew 26, verse 14. It says, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. So Jesus Christ was sold, as you guys know, for 30 pieces of silver. And from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. All right. Now, I wanted to read that to you. And I'll just, you don't need to turn there. I just want to read to you from Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12. Because once again, 500 years before this happened... This was prophesied in the Bible. In Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12, it says, And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. I mean, Zechariah records the words of Judas Iscariot, of what he's saying to the, to the scribes. He says, Look, if you think it's good for me to betray Jesus, give me my price. Meaning that it's Judas that came up with the price of 30 pieces of silver. And he goes, And if not, forbear, for they weighed uh, for my price 30 pieces of silver. Hey, that's just 500 years before these events took place, prophesied by the prophet Zechariah. So if you're ever wondering, you know, was Jesus betrayed and he didn't know about it? You know, was this, you know, was, was, God, was God caught off guard? You know, did God have to go to plan B because plan A failed? No. You know, of course, Jesus Christ, you know, the Lord God knew that he would be betrayed. And, you know, we see the proof of that in the, the writings of the Old Testament prophets. So please go to, uh, back to Luke 22, verse 6. Luke 22, verse 6. I mean, what a sad thing to betray the Lord God, the Messiah, for 30 pieces of silver. I mean, is that, I don't know if that's a lot of money, 30 pieces of silver. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, what, what's an ounce of silver cost these days? $25? $25, $30? So 30 of that, what's that? What does that work out to be? 30 times, let's say $30. 30 times 30, who's got a mass? What is it? $900. 900? Yeah, 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 30. That's right, yeah. All right, cool. I mean, for $900, betraying the Messiah, but it's probably undervalued right now in, in, our, in our, the way we look at silver anyway. But uh, look at verse number six there. It says, And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. So it's Judas Iscariot that had to find a way to betray him in the absence of the multitude. In private, in other words, okay? Because the multitude that the scribes knew would raise up and protect Christ. No, Judas Iscariot was called to do it in private, all right? So now what I want to do is just drop down to verse 21. Drop down to verse 21. We'll continue going through this chapter, but let's drop down to verse 21. We'll keep it on the topic of Judas Iscariot right now. And of course, this is, uh, you know, Jesus Christ has the, Lord's, has, the, has, the, the, has the Last Supper. And then he says this to his disciples in verse 21. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. I mean, look, this is, these are his 12 disciples. These are the closest men that he had during his ministry. He says, the person that's going to betray me is right here on this table. Once again, Jesus Christ knew very well that he was going to be betrayed. Okay, verse 22. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire amongst themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. You know, the disciples had no clue. They had no idea. They were asking amongst themselves, you know, is it I? Is it me? Is it you? Who, who, who is it that could betray the Lord? You see, and this is what you need to understand about the local New Testament church, guys, is that we could have a reprobate in our midst. We could have a betrayer. We could have someone who wants to hurt our church, to hurt our ministry. There could be someone in our church today. You know, I hope not. 
I hope not. But it's possible. Because here's the thing, you're not going to know. You know, in fact, probably the one that stands out the most is probably not the one that's going to be trained. Okay, it's usually someone that's undercover, that's hidden. Okay, does, that does not want to be found out to be that reprobate betrayer. And um, so please, you know, be aware. You know, I'm not saying, you know, don't trust anybody and like, don't, you know, you know, try to find out who's a reprobate in the church. And no, that's going to cause, um, you know, a division in the church. That's going to cause problems in the church. But always be aware, you know, I would, I would never, you know, put myself in a position. Now, I'm a very trusting person. I, I just trust people, generally speaking. But I would never put myself in a position, even amongst church brethren, where if they, hurt, if they betrayed me, I would be damaged. Where it would hurt my family, where it would hurt my children. I would never put myself in a position where I'm relying on someone so much that if they were to betray me, it would you know, hurt me and my family or hurt, hurt the church. So, you know, I would say, you know, it's probably wise to be the same way. You know, be, be, be protective, especially for the family, the children that God has given you to protect. And uh, let's keep going, though, um, in verse 24. And I think this is um, pretty understandable. So first they're inquiring amongst themselves, who could betray Jesus? But then in verse 24 it says, and there was also a strife among them. All right? That's why, you know, you don't need to be wondering, who's the reprobate? It's going to cause strife in the church. But look at this. And there was strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest? <laughs> okay, so at first they're like, who could it be? Is it, is it me? And then it's like they seek to justify themselves. Now they're trying, now they're arguing about who's the greatest? Okay, because they're probably going like, it can't be me that betrays Jesus. I've done all these works. I've, I cast... You know, I cast out five devils when Jesus sent me out. No, I cast out seven devils. You know, I healed two blind people. No, I healed, you know. And so they're discussing, hey, look at all the works that we've done. They're trying to figure out who's the greatest, right? Because they don't want to be the one that's counted as the one that betrays Jesus, okay? They started to compare their works. Look at verse 25. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. Okay? Hey, I, I don't want you to be like the, like the Gentiles, uh, you know, uh, that lord over their people. He says, but ye shall not be so. But he that is the greatest among you, let him be as the younger. Um, and he that is chief, as he that doth serve. Hey, if you want to be the greatest, the best thing to do is to consider yourself the youngest. You know, consider yourself the least. You know, be the most humble. Be the one that comes and serves the brethren. Verse 27. For whether is greater, or who's greater, he says, he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth? So just that question, think about that yourself. Who's greater? You know, if, if, if you're sitting at a, at a table and you're being served, is the person that's being served the greater or is it the person that comes to serve? Obviously, the greater is the one that sits at meat waiting to be served okay that's why he's got a servant because the servant is serving his master obviously the one that sits to meet is greater it says uh, after he asked that question he says is not he that sitteth at meat so jesus is saying yeah the one that sits to meet but i am among you as he that serveth he goes look even though i'm the greater obviously i'm the son of god i'm the messiah even even though that's the case i come here serving you Okay, so Jesus Christ at the Last Supper was not seeking to be served. He was serving his disciples. Okay, and you know, he probably served the meal. We know that he definitely served them by washing their feet. All right, so that's what Jesus is saying. Look, right now, right now, um, you know, it's important for you to be a servant. Right now, it's important for you to serve one another. But there is a coming a time, there is coming a time when you will be served. There is a coming a time when you will be considered great in the kingdom of, of heaven. Look at verse 28 there. He says, ye are, they, uh, ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. So it's not just that we ought to serve one another. It's not just telling his disciples, hey, serve one another, but that you're also called to face the same trials and temptations as Jesus Christ. Hey, right now, on, on this side of, of, of life, before Christ comes and establishes the millennial kingdom, we're here to be servants of God. We're here to face the trials and temptations that come by being named a, a disciple of, of Christ, by being named a, a child of God. Okay, That's what we're called to do right now. We're, we're called to go through hardships, to go through persecutions. 
to go through difficulties and troubles, okay? But to, even in the face of those things, to be thinking about how can I serve the Lord? How can I be serving the brethren? There is coming a time in the millennial kingdom when we get those opportunities, the tables are flipped and we'll be the ones that are served. Let's keep reading verse 29. He says to his disciples, And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father have appointed unto me. So we know the kingdom of Christ, the millennial reign of Christ, is a kingdom that's been given to Christ by the Father. And he says, look, in that kingdom, I've also appointed you a kingdom. All right? Verse 30. This is obviously the future. All right? That's the time. That's it. You know, to be, to be seen as great, that's coming in the future. That's coming in the millennial kingdom to come. Verse 30. Now it says, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But remember, he said, who's the greater? The one that sits to meet, the one that, the one that sits down to, to, be, to eat. And he says, that's going to happen. In verse 30, he says, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. Okay, so right now, you know, it's our time to serve. The future time is the time to rule and reign with Christ, okay? And talk about greatness then, all right? Right now, I don't want you to talk about who's the greatest. I want you to be going, hey, I'm the least. I'm the least of the brethren. You know, everyone in this church is better than I am, and I'm going to try to serve uh, my brethren here in my church. That's, that's what Christ is calling for us. Now, I wanted to read this to you in verse 30 then, and that's, we're not going to go beyond verse 30, but we'll go back and look at the Lord's Supper is that Jesus Christ has established 12 thrones for his 12 disciples to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, so that's going to be the millennial kingdom. I don't know if that's going to extend into the new heavens and the new earth, but definitely the millennial kingdom. Uh, but of course, we know Judas Iscariot was the one that betrayed Jesus. Okay, we know that Judas Iscariot, after he betrays Jesus, commits suicide. Okay, and he's, he's, he's damned. He goes to hell. He, he's a son of perdition. So, the question is, who's going to fill the 12 thrones? Of course, we have the 11 that remained, but who's that last one? And um, my, it's my personal opinion that it's uh, Matthias. Now, basically, in Christendom, people argue these things all the time. They're like, is it Matthias or is it the Apostle Paul? Okay, and not, not Matthias. So you guys are looking at Matthias, not, not Matthias. Matthias, okay, Matthias. So let's have a look at this very quickly. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. And of course, remember, the book of Acts was written by Luke as well. So Acts is pretty much just a continuation, you know, from the book of Luke. So let's go to Acts chapter 1, verse 15. Acts chapter 1, verse 15. And it says here, um, In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. And he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now, it's an interesting thing that you have a reprobate that was ordained by Jesus Christ as an apostle. And even though he's, you know, all that works is for nothing for, that he did. You know, even though he's damned, they recognize that he was part of the ministry. And they recognize his ordination that came by Jesus Christ. Let's drop down to verse number 20. It says, um, For it, it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, but his bishopric let another take. Okay, let, and his bishopric let another take. Now, bishopric sounds a lot like bishop. And it's the same kind of idea. Okay, it's an office that was held by Judas Iscariot, he says, let another person take that office. So it's interesting that even though he was a reprobate, his office was still legitimate. Okay, it was, it was, still, uh, it was still seen as legitimate to the, to the point where even the apostles here said, hey, we need to take that office and give it to someone else now. Okay, because he has uh, uh, been, um, he's committed suicide, he's dead, we need someone else now to take that position. Let's keep reading, verse 21. Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So there we have, he says, look, the one we're going to appoint to this position, the one we're going to ordain to this position is someone that must have been there with us from the baptism of John. And that they saw Jesus Christ get baptized by John you know, they were there. He was there um, from, even as a witness of the resurrection. 
he says, must be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. He was amongst us. He was with us and saw the resurrection of Christ and that uh, uh, he was also taken up from us. So he also witnessed Christ being taken up to be seated at the right hand of the Father. So who they, they, they uh, work out to be, that to be, verse 23, and they appointed two. Joseph called uh, Basabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. So there were two men that fit this category um, for them to replace Judas Iscariot with. Verse 24, And they prayed and said, Thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So some people say, well, that was just Peter. You know, it's just Peter coming up with the idea we better replace Judas Iscariot. And, you know, that wasn't really God's intention. God really wanted the apostle Paul. And, and, and uh, so that's one reason. It's like, well, they cast lots. You know, is that really the right way to do it? I mean, probably not. <laughs> okay, But they did pray for the Lord to, you know, make sure they make the right decision. So maybe even without the casting of lots, they probably would have come to the conclusion of Matthias anyway. Um, but also, it says here he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Okay, and that's, that's sort of important to, to remember. But also, it's in chapter 1 of the book of Acts. You know, it, it sort of seems important to me that God would record this at the beginning of the book of Acts because we know then the rest of the book of Acts are about the works of the apostles and, and so forth. And um, well, some people say as well, well, it can't be Matthias because he's never named anymore in the Bible. This is the only time he's named. We don't see anything else that he does. And so it wasn't Matthias, but we know a lot about Paul. But, I mean, there's that argument, but also, after this time, the only, the only apostles that are named after this is uh, Peter, uh, John, and James, J the death of James. Like, the other apostles aren't mentioned either. So it's kind of like, well, I mean, they're not named either, so why is it significant that Matthias is not named later either? You know, just, you know it's just that, uh, you know, God focuses on, on certain people. So let me just, um, let's go to... Uh, I, I didn't write them down, but anyway, it doesn't matter. I, I just wanted to show you that it's, it's my opinion. I, I'm willing for you guys to change my minds if you want, um, that it was Matthias that took up that 12th position and that he'll take up that 12th throne judging one of the tribes of Israel. And the, the question becomes, well, what about Paul? I mean, he does so many works. You know, surely he should be one that sits there. I would just say maybe Paul has, a, has another position. Maybe he'll be judging, you know, many of the Gentile nations to come. I mean, yeah, he did great works. I'm sure the Lord's going to reward him. Um, and some people think that uh, it's, it's Paul because, you know, he's clearly called an apostle, you know. And so that was God's choice. But the thing is, there are many, and we've gone through this already, that there are many apostles. You know, even Barnabas is named an apostle um, in the Bible. So it's my, my opinion. Even Actually, let's go there. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15 very quickly. 1 Corinthians 15. I don't have that in my notes, but just very quickly, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So um, 1 Corinthians 15 is, let's read from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you, this is Paul writing, of course, the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now notice verse 5. And that He was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the twelve. You notice that? Because He wasn't an apostle at this time. But He calls them the twelve. Okay, And then later on in verse number 9, or verse number, verse number 8, he says, And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So we see even Paul, and remember, he's under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Even he doesn't classify himself as one of the twelve. He says he was seen of the twelve. But we know by Acts chapter 1 that Matthias was amongst the 12 when he was seen at the, you know, the resurrection of Christ and, and the taking up of you know, being before the right-hand side of the Father. So that's why I believe it's Matthias. You know, I, I, don't really have, I don't really see any other 
clear passage that says it's John, it's sorry, it's Paul the Apostle is one of the twelve. There's, no, there's nothing like that. It seems like even Paul himself recognized he's not numbered amongst the twelve there. Anyway, that's a side note. It's not that important, but I thought, you know, a lot of people wonder that question. If you were wondering, you know, at least you have an answer there. Let's go back to Luke chapter 22, please. Luke chapter 22. And let's, uh, let's go to verse number 7 now. Luke chapter 22, verse 7. So let's just have a look at the Last Supper now. Verse number 7. And then it says here, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou, where wilt thou that we prepare? So I just want you to notice, Jesus says, Prepare the Passover. Okay, so what do you think they prepare? They're going to prepare the Passover. Okay, and verse number seven said, Then came the day of unleavened bread. And if you know the Old Testament story, they weren't allowed to have any leaven, uh, you know, in the house. Okay, the only thing they were allowed to eat was the unleavened bread. So we know as they prepare, they're going to have unleavened bread at this last supper. Okay, they're going to have unleavened bread at this last meal before Christ is crucified. And then it says in verse number uh, 10, And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And he shall say unto the good men of the house, sorry, and ye shall say unto the good men of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? So what are they going to eat? The Passover, okay, with the disciples. And he shall show you a large upper room furnished, there make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. I mean, how many times do you have to read there? You know, Passover, Passover, Passover. They made ready the Passover. They were to prepare the Passover. So keep your finger there. Let's go to Exodus chapter, uh, sorry, yeah, Exodus chapter 12, please. Exodus chapter 12. I think I need some water. Exodus chapter 12, please. Because what I want to talk about here, of course, is how we do communion. And I've already preached on this, but now's the proper time to do it because we're going for the Last Supper. You know, why do we do communion the way we do it? You know, communion is also given the name of the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table. It's when we partake of the bread and the wine or the grape juice, if you want to say it that way. You know, remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially His death. That's, that's sort of the, the key thing when it comes to doing communion. But look at Exodus chapter 12, please. Verse 8, Exodus chapter 12, verse 8. It says, and this is after Christ. Christ says, look, on the, on the 14th day of the month of Nisan, you are, you are to kill the, the, the Passover lamb. Okay? And then it says here in verse number 8, And they shall eat the flesh in the, that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. And with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat, it, uh, eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof, pertinence means like all the insides as well. And ye shall, uh, and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded. Now this is important. It says when you eat it, make sure your loins are girded. And make sure you're fully dressed. Make sure you've got your, you know, your, your clothes on, your belt on. It says your shoes on your feet. Make sure you're wearing shoes, you know, and your staff in your hand. Say, why? This is, we'll have a look. And you shall eat it in haste. You need to eat it fast, okay? It is the Lord's Passover. It is the Lord's Passover. Johnny, sit down, please. All right? It's the Lord's Passover. So remember, they went to eat it fully dressed with a staff ready to go because you know the story that soon after this happened, you know, Pharaoh would allow the, the Israelites to leave Egypt. And, and, and the instruction was, you've got to do it in haste. You've got to go. You've got to be packed, ready to go. It's all going to be done very quickly. Okay? But we see that they ate unleavened bread. Okay? And now go to the book of Deuteronomy, please. Deuteronomy chapter 16. Because the book of Deuteronomy ex explains what the unleavened bread... And we, we kind of gather that by the context there in Exodus 12. But look at Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 2. When they look back at the Passover... Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 2, it says, uh, Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God of the flock and of the herd in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. 
Thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction. Look at this. Why? Why unleavened bread? For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, that thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. You see, the importance of it being unleavened, yes, some people say it's because it's a picture, leaven is a picture of sin. I understand that. But really the context of it, uh, the, the, the greater context, the primary understanding of why it means what the unleavened bread represents, it is to be done in haste. It is to be done quickly. You see, you can make unleavened bread very quickly. Okay? But if you add yeast, if you add leaven, you want it to raise and you want to eat bread the sort of standard way we eat, that takes time. It takes several hours for it to be ready, you know, once you put yeast in the bread for it to ri rise and, and to be able to eat bread like that. You know, eating leavened bread is not something that can be done in haste. It takes time for you to wait for that bread to be ready. But you know what? You put that unleavened bread in the, in the frying pan, it's ready to go very quickly. And that's why it's done in haste, because it's a picture of them coming out of the land of Egypt. And I've already covered this, but it's also a picture of our salvation. Because, you know, it, it's, it's done in haste. It's quick. It's done. As soon as you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved. It's not some long process. It's not something you've got to wait around for. Am I saved? No, once you've believed on Christ, you're ready to go. You've got your staff in hand. You've got your shoes on. You get out there now. You're saved. You know, you, you, you've come out of the power of sin. It's the same kind of picture of coming out of Egypt in haste. All right? So, yeah, um, it doesn't require additional time uh, waiting for the bread to rise. So that's why when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we have unleavened bread. Number one, because that's what they used. But number two, it pictures the salvation that we have, that it's, it's, it's immediate, okay? Um, so let's keep reading then. Uh, if we can go to back to, uh, let's have a look. Luke 22, please, verse 14. Luke chapter 22, verse 14. Uh, verse 14. And the reason I say that to you guys, there are churches, there are preachers and pastors that just want to be different on purpose. And they'll say things like, well, the New Testament never commands that the Lord's Supper should be done with unleavened bread. Yes, the apostles did it with unleavened bread. Okay, but there's no other references in the New Testament to say, therefore, I'm going to have the Lord's Supper with leavened bread. It's just, it's just, people do things to be different. People do things to stand out, to, you know, try to make a name for themselves. But, you know, it's just, it's so dumb when we have the consistency of the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Of course, we're going to carry through, especially if it's a picture of salvation, especially if it's a picture of that, then, of course, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper with unleavened bread. But let's keep reading. Verse 14, Luke 22, verse 14. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now, this is another debate amongst Christians. Did Jesus eat the Passover lamb? Okay. Now, here's the thing. When Christ was crucified on the cross, okay, that was the same time Okay, because it was on the 14th day of the month of, of, of Nisan, where they were meant to uh, kill the lamb and roast it with fire, you know, to be eaten. Well, when Christ was crucified, and that was done in the evening, by the way, um, it's, it, it corresponded with Christ's crucifixion. Okay, so the lamb was meant to be killed and cooked the day of his crucifixion. Here we have the Last Supper. It's the day prior to his crucifixion. It's the day prior to the lamb being uh, killed and, and, and cooked. Okay, so the question is, did Jesus have the Passover a day before? And some people think he did because he went, you know, saying we're going to prepare the Passover and eat the Passover and things like that. Now, I can understand that opinion that maybe he did it one day earlier, but I, I struggle with it as well. I, I personally don't believe he ate the Passover lamb. Okay, I, I, that's my personal belief. Okay, I don't think there's anything really inherently wrong with if he did because, you know, he's the Lord God. Okay. But we know that Christ came to fulfill Scripture. We know that He came keeping the commands. So if the command was to kill the lamb a day later, I struggle to, to reconcile that with Christ doing it one day before. Okay? But you say, but Jesus said, prepare the Passover. 
Yeah, they went to prepare the Passover. There was a preparation of the Passover, obviously, before they ate the Passover. Okay? So they were prepared. They were ready to go. There was a lamb picked out, I suppose, but it had not yet been killed. But they had, you know, the, the, the unleavened bread ready to go as well. And so it is my opinion that they ate another meal. They just had a pre-Passover meal, but they had unleavened bread as well because that's what they prepared for. Okay? And, uh, and if we look at verse number um, 15 once again, again, a lot of people have different opinions as to what this is. And guys, I, I'm willing to hear your thoughts. I, I really, I really, I actually want, I, want, I want to hear what you guys have to say. But verse 15, let's look at it again. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So they say, well, see, he desired to eat the Passover before he suffered, before he died. So he must have eaten the Passover, they say. Well, you can also interpret that another way. Okay, he says, with desire, I have desired to eat the Passover, meaning I desire to have this Passover with you, but I'm not going to do because I'm going, I'm going to suffer. Like I'm, I'm going to, you know, I have that desire to do it, but it's just not going to happen. Okay, and then it says, verse 16, for I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So you can, you can take these verses and basically formulate whichever position you take on that, you can sort of make it mean one or the other. Okay, so I, I, I personally don't believe he ate the Passover lamb. But if he ate it one day early, I don't think that's a big doctrinal problem because, again, he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Okay, he didn't, you know, uh, he, he's the Lord, of, uh, Lord God. But, yeah, I just, I, I think he had to, you know, do things properly and he did not eat the Passover. He, be, he, he was the Passover lamb. He became the Passover lamb. And the reason when we participate of the Lord's Supper, the reason we don't have a lamb, okay, is because Christ is our Passover lamb. You know, and um, I, I'm not of the opinion that the Lord's Supper is a continuation of, of the Passover. Did I get that wrong? I'll just say it again. I'm not of the opinion that the Lord's Supper is not, a, is, is not a continuation of the Passover. But they are very similar. They both point to the same thing. Okay? I believe the, the Lord's Supper is a New Testament ordinance, a brand new New Testament ordinance. Let's keep reading. Verse number 17 there. Verse number 17. Luke 22, verse 17. It says, And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. So we see, what did they drink? They drank of the fruit of the wine, of the vine. Okay, so they, they drank grape juice. Okay, now again, people well, it must have been alcoholic because, you know, Jesus speaks of wine. But notice that Jesus calls it the fruit of the vine. Notice he doesn't just call it wine which can have two meanings, okay? It can, can be uh, alcohol or it can be non-alcoholic, but he actually calls it the fruit of the vine. You know, meaning, you know, I understand that to mean that that juice they were drinking had just literally come off the vine. You know, it, and remember, remember, if, if, if uh, leaven is a picture of, of sin and yeast is, is a very similar thing to, to leaven, it op operates in the same way, then that would also be a picture of sin. You know, you'd be staining the, the grape juice with the, with the picture of sin. And of course, the, the, the grape juice represents the blood of Christ. And of course, Jesus Christ was without sin. But not only that, remember, the reason I had the unleavened bread is because it was done in haste. So again, think about the process of, of squeezing grapes from the vine and making it to alcohol. That requires time as well. It requires time to ferment, you know. And if they were doing it in haste, you know, then obviously they would have drunk, you know, um, non-alcoholic grape juice. Okay, so the reason why we have non-alcoholic grape juice, the reason why we have unleavened bread, is because we follow the pattern that Jesus Christ gave us here on the, on the Last Supper, and that's how we do communion, that's how we do uh, the Lord's table. Alright, so if I've not explained that very well, please let me know. Let's keep reading verse number 19. Verse number 19. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it, and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. So now he's teaching from a year ago in the last, the previous Passover. Now he's explaining it all to, to them. Right? The spiritual understanding of participating of his bread, of the bread of his body and the blood, represent, uh, the, 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 yeah, drinking his blood. Now we have this representation that he's teaching us here. And um, do this in remembrance of me. Verse number 20. Likewise also the cup after, after, after supper saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Okay, so when we participate of the Lord's Supper, it's about remembering Christ. Okay, this isn't something we take lightly. It's not something that we should just not take seriously. 
Okay, when we participate of the Lord's Supper, we are remembering the broken body of Christ. That God prepared a body for His Son that, that, that was sinless, that was perfect. Okay, it's the righteousness of Christ that is imputed upon us when we believe in Him. It's so important that He was perfect without sin. Okay, and that same perfect body without sin was then broken for us. Okay, it was broken for us. And of course, when it was broken, the blood was shed. You know, the blood of the New Testament. And of course, you know, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16 says, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Okay, so we're remembering that the Son of God, you know, shed his blood for us, broke his body for us, suffered cruel torture for us. You know, so when we participate of the Lord's Supper, we take it seriously, guys. You know, and, and just one other thing I want to mention is we, we take it. I believe it's important that we take it with supper, you know, with dinner. When we do it, there's a meal that we can share together. We can serve one another as we bring that meal. And then we participate of the, of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. So that's what I've got for you today. Um, next week, we'll go through the other verses in Luke chapter 22. But yeah, I hope that gives you an insight, you know, seeing how Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus. You know, be aware, you know, not everybody that claims to be a Christian, not everybody that has a position of authority in the church is necessarily a believer. There's a lot of reprobates out there, okay? And, and also, remember, you know, don't forget, Jesus Christ says, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus wants us to be remembering his death for us, you know, how much he suffered for us. And, you know, we can, you know, it's a somber, it's a somber time. But it's also a time of rejoicing to know that's the sacrifice that, you know, God has given us. So let's pray.